today, I would like to start I'd like to start by by saying, uh, welcome all you rebels. <laughs> so why do I say that? Why do I say welcome all you rebels? Well, um, every year we put out an annual report. And in that annual report, uh, my staff tries to goad me into writing some words of wisdom. And I fully admit there's not a lot of times that I write very wisdomy words. But in this last annual report, I put together a short little letter. And actually, given the fact that uh, we lost one of the rebels of the, the uh, political world just yesterday, I think the timing might be fairly good to read this annual report to you. And it also provides reasons why I feel pretty comfortable in saying welcome all you rebels. So I'll start. This year marks ASA's 50th year of existence. On November 7th, 1968, Charles Dodge, Charles Cope, Dale Lynch, Jesse Malone, Jerry Moore, Ray Woodward, Jack Winokur, and William Yaw met in the office, the Chicago office of Say and Thomas to form the American Semitol Association. Winninger became ASA's first chairman of the board and Lynch its first executive vice president. Nine trustees were elected to the original board. Eight days after ASA's founding, Dale Lynch became ASA's first member, logging ASA number one on November 15th. From that point, ASA membership grew rapidly with ASA member 10,000 issued less than a decade later. Early ASA members were mavericks who shunned the feel-good fluff of the permeated the breed associations of the time in favor of concepts new to our industry. Concepts like crossbreeding, performance testing, and scientific-based animal breeding. To be sure, these new concepts were met with resistance from the entrenched interest of the time. The established associations were nearing a century old with little more than a pendulum swings to show for it. Even so, the associations were viewed with reverence, with the reverence of a religion by their members, and the ideals and cattle of the upstart ASA represented a serious threat to the status quo. Though their willingness to rankle tradition led to an effort to discredit the new association, ASA forged forward with their conviction that our ideals and cattle are fit for the U.S. beef industry, which is described in an excerpt from Pierce Mullins' A Record of Achievement. That was a book that was written back at our 20-year reunion. So I pulled this from that book. Pierce Mullins stated that the American Semitol Association's bylaws aimed at reproducing the American political experience. They embraced the idea of America as a melting pot if people from the far corners of the globe could come together in a new country and make a new life, then certainly cattle of different nationalities could as well. Fifty years later, ASA has proudly evolved into the seed stock industry's melting pot boasting the world's largest genetic evaluation with cattle of virtually every breed and breed combination represented. There is little question that ASA's ideals and cattle have played a role in propelling the industry forward over the last half century. ASA's founding principles, once thought to be heresy, are now widely embraced. What was a fledgling organization has evolved into a dominant force in the seed stock industry. We are now on the cusp of a future in which our ideals and cattle have the potential to be rewarded even more profoundly than they have in the past. To assure that reward, we must continue to focus on our principal reason for existence, to benefit the commercial cattle producer. In many ways, uh, that principle continues to be a maverick stance in our industry. Far too many organizations exist to serve what they see as the best interest of their breed, oftentimes at the expense of the commercial producer. Our willingness to take a non-traditional stance has served ASA and our industry well over the past 50 years. If focusing on the commercial cattle producer makes us mavericks over the next 50, then mavericks we will be. So welcome mavericks. <laughs> So 
with that, I want to do some bookkeeping. Start off, Jackie has, has told me I absolutely need to do this. We, we are on face, Facebook Live. Uh, if you want a recording of what we're doing today, it will be on uh, fallfocus.org. And I would need to remind every speaker, and that is anybody in the audience too, we want to have an interactive, we're going to have some interactive sessions, and so we want anybody that is asking questions or making comments in the audience to have a microphone. So we'll start out with that. Then I said last night I talked about introducing the dignitaries, and I wanted you guys to clean up pretty good. See, Dave, I think took a shower. Um, so I think we're in good shape. So anyway, we'll start out with past trustees. So I'll read down the list. Dave Nichols. And if you, when you hear your name, stand and remain standing. And I don't know if everybody, I've looked over the crowd quick, I don't know if everybody's made it, but here are the people that were on the list to be here. Dave Nichols, Mike Stolte, I know I saw him this morning, he's way in the back. Bill McDonald, we should be able to see him if he's here. <laughs> Jesse Driggers, he's shrunk up, so he's harder to see now, but he's back there in the back. Jimmy Butcher, Dale Miller, and Bob Lanting. Now, we have more trustees, and I'll go on. These, all of these trustees were also chairman of the board, and I think it's probably, I don't think I'd be going out on a limb to say we might have more chairmen of the board together in one place than we've ever had. I think that's a distinct possibility. So, the other chair, or the other trustees I have, and remain, everybody remain standing because you're past trustees. Uh, Willie Allenberg's here. And it, it pains me to say the distinguished part and, and then announce Willie, but I'll do it. <laughs> Take one for the team, Willie. Scott Cowder, I don't know if he's in here, he's in the back there, yep. Laura Rose, right up here in front like a good girl. Supposed to sit up front. Usually it'd be Beth and then there'd be one more sitting right there. Anyway, Kevin Thompson is here. Beth, yep, Beth Mercer's right in the front. Kurt Russell and Susan Russell. Susan's back there, Michael Dykeman, Jimmy Holloman, and John Harker. Are there any other trustees that I missed, former trustees? I went through the list of former trustees. Oh, well, I guess, yeah. <laughs> now, you, so Gordon makes a point, and actually if we go down that path, there's a number, there's a number of, there's a number of, but I'm, you guys are gonna get your due in just a minute. So these are all, past trustees, and let's give them a hand. They are part of the rebel nation. They've done tremendous work. So with that, we will move towards current trustees. Uh, I'm gonna go by region. Uh, we're gonna start out with the East, Brian DeFries. Stand and be noticed. See you back there, Brian, Gordon Hodges, uh, Jimmy Ligon, Jim Ligon, and Randy Moody, and Cliff Orley. There he is. So those are your, your uh, trustees from the east to remain standing. Uh, Steve Iacker in the North Central. Tom Hook. John Irvin and Erica Kenner. Is she Erica here with us? Mm -hmm. I can't see that far. Anyway, I'll take your word for it. So that that rounds out the North Central. We've got the South Central. We've got John Griswold from Oklahoma, Fred Schutz, Texan, Tim Smith, Gary Updike. From the West, Tim Kern, Mike Foreman, Clay Lastly, and Tom Nelson. So again, 
So you see where your representatives are. If you need to talk to them, let them know. Let them know whatever you have on your mind. So give them a round of applause. Yeah, yeah, so we've got four on the current board that were previous previous trustees. So oh chairman, yeah, right, right, that's right. Yes, yes. I forgot about that. Thanks. So I really was I was undershooting it. We we've blown the thing right out of the water. Okay. So we've got some other special guests. Uh, one of them's already standing back there, the white hat guy. Tries to convince people he's a he's a good guy, and he, he is. There's no doubt about that. It's my friend Bruce Holmquist from the Canadian Semitol Association. I believe Bob Morton is Bob Morton here. Bob Morton is maybe he's not here. So Bob Morton is the chairman of the Red Angus Association of America, uh, which is a Red Angus Association of America is a partner with us in IGS. Um, Bob was there last night, so he apparently didn't make it this early. Um, so anyway, uh, we will, I'd like to honor, um, well, just in general, we don't have a lot of time. Jackie has, has told me I have to move through this quickly, so I'm, I'm not gonna ask for all the employees to stand up, but I do wanna acknowledge employees that had hit 30 years, and some of them are here, uh, some of them were here last night. In fact, a good share of them, I think, if not all of them were here last night. Um, but I'm gonna go through this the list, and if you happen to be here, and you hear your name, stand up. Linda Harris-Bakken, uh, she was here last night. She's not here now. Kay Thayer, uh, Paulette Koschenauer, again, all three of those were here. Marilyn Roth, uh, Linda Kessler is here. Couldn't get along if she wasn't. She's at the oh, she's at the office. She's working. She's <laughs> at the office working. Cynthia Connor, I think I saw Cynthia back there. Cynthia puts together the magazine. Stand up, Cynthia. Uh, Nancy Chesterfield. She'd have to stand on a table. <laughs> I think she's out outside there working at the desk. Uh, Dan Reeder, Jim Largest and Steve McGuire, and you don't have to stand, Steve, because I know you got a big day later, so you gotta, <laughs> gotta rest up. So, anyway, those are all employees that have been with us 30 years, and I think that's amazing, and I think that really goes to the heart of the success of ASA. Long-term employees make things work. And, and so, yeah, well, And I know, and I'm not going to go into it because Jackie wants me to move on, but we have the best employees in the business, and if you get a chance to talk to them, I think it's wonderful because so many of us that, you know, we, we travel around, you see our faces, we're in the magazines, and, and we get the credit, but the, the people behind the scenes back home in the office do the work, and now you have a chance to see them. When you come to town, that's why I just love having this this event in Bozeman because you get a chance to see all the employees and I think that's critical and and they pull this thing off and they pull they make the thing work they just flat make make the business work so anyway round of applause for the ASA employees so I want to also so we've got specialists um, we've evolved to we're focusing even more strongly now uh, with our uh, outreach program on education because that is a core, one of the core functions of our existence is education. Uh, so we've got some of the specialists that are actually here. Uh, we don't have the whole group. We had a meeting a couple days ago. Um, go down the list. So Chris Davis, stand up when you hear your name. Uh, I think Chris is here this morning. There he is. Uh, Michael Dykeman, former trustee, uh, Ben Spitzer, way in the back there, Carrie Crow, Russ Danielson, 
Susan Russell, Bill Zimmerman, and Bert Moore. So that's a pretty powerful group. These, these people are representing with Leoma Wells as their, their leader. Go ahead and stand up, Leoma. Um, anyway, they are spread around the country. They have a, lifetimes of experience. I'd hate to add it all up, but lots of years of experience in the cattle business. And, and they are they're professional educators in every sense of the word. So give them a round. So with that, I am going to bring up, I'll introduce our chairman of the board, Tim Smith. Uh, Tim has a, a master's in, uh, in nutrition from the University of Kentucky. Uh, he runs a 300 head operation in Giddings, Texas. He also has a transplant center. Uh, he has a, an ongoing, um, it's called the Semitol Simros Super Bowl. And that's held in Texas every fall, right? And in the spring. No. Well, it's the spring or fall. But anyway, um, that has been, over the years, that has been a money generator, a great um, money generator for the youth, over $800,000 in prizes uh, and uh, scholarships that have gone to the youth. And uh, that is... Uh, uh, Tim is one of the founders of that. I think was the other one would be Carlos Guerra. Carlos Guerra. Yeah. Bill Wentz. Bill Wentz, okay. So anyway, with that, I'll pass the baton over to Tim, and he can regale you with uh, wisdom. Well, I wouldn't say that much. I would say Jackie knows you well because she said, Tim, keep this short and sweet and get us back on time schedule, please. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. First of all, thank you very much, Wade. On behalf of your current board and this staff, I want to welcome you to your 50th anniversary celebration, your fifth fall focus and educational symposium, and to the interactive board meetings tomorrow. We appreciate you being here very, very much. When I stand at this podium, one word comes to my mind. Big room and wow, what a big crowd. I commend you all for taking the time and effort to be here. When Wade went to the introductions and I sat there in that chair and I said, I'm the current chairman, but he introduced all the former board members and the former chairmen that are in here. If you just stop and think of the amount of leadership and power and foresight that's sitting in this room, it gives me chills because it's pretty powerful. There's a lot of you. And uh, I want to give the accolades to the staff. They had a very collaborative effort in putting together the theme for this celebration. Embrace the past, imagine the future. So when you talk about embracing the past, you think about all the authority that's come through from you former board members and from you breeders that had the foresight to collect the data to put us where we are today. Serving on the board today is much easier than serving on the board for some of you all. I, I, I've been in business for 35 years, so I know we went through some difficult times. But today we're celebrating the hard work, the effort, the energy, and the time that you put forward. So give your all selves a big round of applause and let's also applaud the staff for putting this excellent theme together and allowing us to have the foresight to move forward. So give yourself a round of applause. I think that uh, it's important to say not only welcome but thank you. When you sit here and look as I talked about the leadership and the authority and the wisdom in the room it's very interesting to see that, that you all are lifelong learners. You're back here for the newest stuff, the cutting edge stuff, and to take the time and effort out of your schedules to continue to be learning when most of you know a heck of a lot more than I'll ever dream of knowing. I appreciate that time and effort. Uh, I want to thank the staff once again on behalf of the board for the time and effort to pull this entire celebration off. And I just want to say that we look forward to an outstanding set of speakers today, sharing with us a lot of their new concepts and ideas. But I also want to remind you that we would love to have you attend the board meeting tomorrow, the next day, and to enjoy the uh, interactive committee meetings and enjoy the interaction here today. We welcome questions, we welcome input, and all we ask, if you bring us a problem, 
bring us a solution. So thank you. And welcome. So, um, so the next uh, part of the, the uh, morning is we are going to bring up uh, Bill McDonald. As you saw earlier, Bill is a past chairman. Uh, he also is a member of the uh, Semital Sembra Foundation, and he has ramrodded uh, the uh, um, the money generation portion of this, or the the uh, donation portion of this, to fund the uh, Fall Focus. I think you've been doing it ever since we started Fall Focus, which would be Yes, we've been doing it five years, I think. So with that, uh, Bill is going to announce the, the, uh, the sponsors for Fall Focus. Thank you, Wade. Appreciate that. Uh, before we uh, get to that, uh, I do have a little limerick. <laughs> but I would have gone last night. But Pilot Wad Wade didn't even have any beer for us to celebrate with. <laughs> but here's the limerick for our golden anniversary. Here's to the ASA. We raise our favorite libation to salute this golden celebration. It is not without due that we honor you because working with this profitable breed of cattle is a pleasure but we know that the members and staff are its greatest treasure. Here's to the ASA. So I want to add to that. <laughs> so, so for those of you that were here a couple of years ago, so we started out the program, and right off the bat, right out of the gate, we had technical difficulties. And I don't know, it took 10, 15 minutes. And Bill came up, Bill is notorious for limericks, and, and some of them, you know, they're a little bit edgy. <laughs> anyway, he, uh, I guess he regaled us, he, he ate up all 15 minutes, we finally had to pull him off the stage, actually. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was very much appreciated, Bill, thank you. Glad to help out one, anytime, I didn't expect one today, but... <laughs> anytime, anytime. Well, uh, this uh, is kind of a, uh, partial functions that the uh, American Simmental Simbri Foundation takes on. Uh, the foundation is three-pronged where it is research, education, and our youth programs. And uh, it's been my pleasure to kind of be the advocate on the foundation for Fall Focus. But we also have others here that are on the foundation. Uh, Fred Shoots, is a non-voting member on the foundation, but we couldn't get rid of him because we needed a chairman. So he's, he's the one that hurt, really hurts cats there. Uh, Greg, uh, where's, are you in, yeah, there he is in the back. Greg is here with us and he's on the foundation. Uh, I saw Lori Episotcher earlier, I don't know if she, there she is, she's in the very back. And we appreciate all they do the true advocate right there for our youth program. And uh, they're very lucky to have her as their advocate. Is there anybody else that's on the foundation board? I haven't had a chance to read. Scott, yeah, Scott. Oh, Scott, yep. Scott, stand up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Kathy, Kathy, please stand up. Let these folks, Fred, stand up to uh, anybody else. Oh, yes, Dr. Jones, go ahead, stand up. Uh, we uh, let's give these folks a round of applause. For doing a lot of the other person that really I want to recognize that gets this thing going is Jackie Atkins. She uh, she works hard to keep us all on time and in line, and I'm messing with her schedule, but she needs to be recognized. So thank you for all she's done, uh, and all the rest of the staff. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have so many good people working for us. Um, first of all, I'd like to recognize the Montana Simmental Association for that lovely meal last night. 
Everybody that's a member of the Montana Simmental Association, would you please stand? Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Other folks that have been very generous and to help sponsor with uh, this fall focus is, and as I call their name with a representative, please stand, uh, Gene Seek. There we are. Thank you. Uh, Fred Smith Company. Fred, where are you? There he is in the back also. Gateway Simmental, Jim, appreciate all you do and your crew. Uh, Kenner Simmental Ranch, uh, Erica, where are you? She's in the hall. She's in the hall. All right, she's, she's always working on something. All Flex, do we have a record from oh, Cody? Hey, uh, Dakota Express Sim Genetics, Gen X. I know there's a couple folks from Gen X here. Y'all can stand up. Or maybe they're not at the time. All right. Uh, Gibbs Farms. Gordon, you're a good rep for them. We appreciate all they do. Uh, LaSalle Ranch Simmentals. Or Lassie, excuse me. My Southwest Virginia <laughs> twist on things. You got to remember. I went through the Chicago airport one time, called a taxi, and the Russian guy was talking there, and I said, where are you from? He said, ah, oh, Chicago. I said, no, you're not. you got too much of an accent and everything, but that's all right. I like accents. I've got one of my own. He said, yeah, you do. You have mountain hillbilly accent. <laughs> so, Learman Family Simmons McDonald Farms. Miller Simmons Thing. Select Sires Incorporated, TNT Simmental Ranch, Kevin, Mr. Heimlich, Trinity Farms, yes, thank you. and Mandan Lake Creek Simmental Ranch, and uh, Mark Barnell Cattle Company. Let's give all these folks a real hand. <laughs> talking there I, I did some quick math and it, it does turn out we have over a fifth of the chairmen that uh, have served over the last 50 years we have 11 of them in the crowd so that's uh, it's got to be a record there's no no way around that so uh, our next speaker uh, is somebody that's probably very familiar to almost all of you um, Many of you maybe don't know him directly, but you certainly would know him indirectly if you followed any history of ASA. Uh, he is ASA's first full-time EVP. Uh, he served, uh, started in 1969 uh, as the EVP and uh, served well and moved the association along. And if you, if you read the book, you'll... Uh, You'll find out some interesting things about Don Vanneman. So Don Vanneman was actually a Californian that migrated to Montana. Uh, he did so uh, to work on a hay crew and fight fires. Uh, the Californians that are coming now aren't coming for that reason, I can tell you that. Uh, he graduated from Montana State College, I guess it was called back then. It wasn't Montana State University. So on the day he graduated, or on the day he took his last test, he was uh, drafted, and he went and served his country nobly. Uh, came back, and he became the first, uh, or, well, he wasn't the first, but you did run the Montana Beef Performance Association. Uh, so basically, he drove around the country uh, with a uh, scale at the back of his pickup, and and weighed I don't know how many thousands a head of cattle. I'm sure it's in the tens of thousands. Did you keep track of it, Don? Nope. So, um, and since that time, since he served ASA, uh, he has established a very successful ranch brokerage and sold many ranches 
over many years across the, the West. So with that, uh, we will ask for uh, Don Vanneman to come and, and uh, the purpose of his talk is to give, him some, give us some sense of the early days of the association. And there's probably nobody better qualified. When you think about it, I mean, it's always almost amazing to have an organization that's 50 years old and you can actually tap into the first EVP. And, and maybe what's even more amazing is the first EVP looks younger than the, the current EVP. <laughs> it just isn't right. Except you've got hair, right? <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Somebody gonna turn the machine on? <laughs> Yeah, it's so much ready to go if you, if you hit oh, the forward. Oh, just hit the button. Oh, okay. There's weight strip. Is it working? No. Should be turned if you hit the button. And then you have to point it over here. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go right to this one. <laughs> this is actually my bumper sticker, but it's red on my Suburban. When I took over Montana Beef Performance as the Executive Secretary in 1967, the average steer calf at auction in Montana in October, weighed 350 pounds. I see a few gray hairs in here. Think back. In those days, we only had three breeds. Hereford, Angus, and Shorthorns. The Hereford people didn't talk to the Angus people, and the Angus people wouldn't talk to the Hereford people. Only Montana beef, and the MSU Extension Service even talked about the benefits of crossbreeding. I was actually physically picked up and thrown out of a beef cattle seminar in the Ruby Valley when I told the Hereford breeders there that they should cross their Hereford cows with Angus bulls. In 1969, I attended the Des Moines National Carcass Contest. Ferry Carpenter, he won the contest with six and a half square inches of ribeye and two and a half inches of back fat. Today, that's called a yield grade five. <laughs> this is why we at ASA offered each state prize money for carcass value per day of age contests. However, we had a hard time verifying birth dates. I had a college professor said he could come within two days by looking at the iris of an eye. We tested him and it didn't work. <laughs> well, what was the mindset 50 years ago? After the Second World War, the college professor said the average housewife couldn't afford to buy a whole beef. So we as breeders should make our beeves even smaller. I want you to look at these next three slides. These are two and three year old bulls that won national shows. The show ring jumped on this, and the cattle, which don't even come up to our belt buckles or could walk under this table here, became the grand champions. I traveled around the state weighing and grading bulls. I found that many purebred breeders in Montana actually had two herds. One for these little pony cattle that had flat tops, were two years old. Show ring bulls. They were breeding them for the other purebred breeders. Then the ones that got too big, well, they were the, for the commercial guys. Of 
course, there were two different feeding regimes, too. You know, the showering cattle, they got the most feed. And they were predetermined before they put them on test. We kind of bugged a Montana beef performance guy. <laughs> Pete Swaffer, oh, uh, in performance circles, it was said that the closer one lived to a national cattle show, the worse the breeding program was. <laughs> in fact, you know, not all of the grand champion's relatives were genetically equal. Pete Swaffer, Executive Secretary of American Shorthorn Association, announced that the shorthorn breed had gone 100% to the pony cattle. Where have all the shorthorns gone? <laughs> that told me that breed associations can really control their destiny. Breeding for pony cattle in the late 1940s through 1960s got us into many genetically abnormal calves called dwarfs or runts. And none of the breed associations would admit there was a problem. After the board died, a guy named McCain wrote a book called The Battle of Bull Runts. But this was after the board sold off all their genetically imperfect pedigreed cattle. Boy, this is a definite no-no if you want to promote fiduciary trust in your members. It's all in this book titled The Battle of Bull Runts. And I sent this to every one of our ASA board members. With our board's approval, I got to hire Dr. Horst Leipold. Kansas State, who specialized in genetic defects in cattle. I even took horse with me over to Switzerland, France, Germany, and Austria. They said and always kept telling me, we've got no genetic defects over here. And yet in their herd books it said, do not breed this line of bulls to this line of cows. There'd be something wrong. Horse spoke German. So why I piled around and had a little bit of wine with the herd owner, horse went back in the barn and he talked to the cattle managers. So we set up, a, with the board's permission, we set up a free program to try to keep genetic defects out of Simmental. We also got into random blood typing with Dr. Clyde Stormont, University of California, Davis. I wanted to keep our pedigrees honest and valid. I'm not very well thought of in some circles. <laughs> For some reason, the English breeds were reluctant to embrace performance testing. Perhaps it created cattle that there was too much daylight under them. <laughs> Remember those pictures, they always piled the snow up so it looked like, or the straw, so it looked like they had no legs. I tried to find a picture of the American Hereford Association, but I couldn't and I didn't want to advertise them anyway. But you'll notice John Wayne. He had a cattle ranch in Arizona. It's a little known fact, but Ray Woodward and I went the first year and visited with Orville Sweet, Executive Secretary of American Hereford Association. And we were kind of wondering if they could help us do pedigrees and that kind of stuff. And right out of the blue, Ray said, you know, Orville, Simmental are long lost relatives of the Hereford breed. He said, why don't you consider registering them in your herd book? Boy, we were physically escorted out of the uh, Hereford Association. <laughs> the good Lord must have been looking over us. We sure wouldn't have black cold Simmental today if they'd have taken us up on that. Oop, what'd I do? There we go. The original
original board were all commercial cattlemen, not a purebred breeder among them. As a team, they were well-rounded, consisting mostly of several cow-calf breeders, one cow-calf feedlot and very modern slaughterhouse owner, a cow-calf attorney, an ag consultant, a professional baseball player, a newspaper editor, a cattle geneticist, and an oil gas man. One of the quiet guys in the group was named Pat Wilson from Frost Proof, Florida. And I remember the first meeting I attended, they were trying to get to know each other and everybody was bragging about how many cows they had and how big their ranch was. And they finally got the path, he wouldn't say anything. And he said, well boys, I don't mean to make you look, belittle you, but he said, I probably spend more on dip and drench than you boys make in the cow business. Pat ran 20,000 cows. He also owned a feedlot. Nine men, just the right size to meet, greet, and get things done. I felt the board progress slowed as the board grew in numbers. The new breed must have list. I wasn't ashamed of Simmental, we had the biggest sign in town. <laughs> the cattle must have a performance record. The association must have open artificial insemination. There must be no color restrictions. Upgrade to purebred females in three crosses and bulls in four crosses. No need to designate full blood on the certificate. We didn't want a milk, draft, dairy cow walking around our pastures. It was easy to see 120 pounds at weaning on the first cross. So we said no show ring. Our show ring is the pastures of the commercial cattleman. You wouldn't believe how many members I got just looking across the fence at that first cross. Well, how do you describe a breed like this in those days? I kind of penned this uh, Simmental motto, visual analysis, tells you what a Simmental appears to be. His pedigree tells you what he should be. His performance and progeny tests tells you what he actually is. I also attribute our success not just to great cattle genetics, but to a wonderful office staff. I don't know how many times the board wanted to move us to Kansas City or to Texas or I'm the one that put them here in Bozeman, Montana. When I came here in 79 to go to college, there was a sign at the edge of town that said, Welcome to Bozeman. 12,000 friendly people and a couple of old sore heads. <laughs> I'd like to find that sign. Especially Kay Thayer, she was my personal secretary and I'm the one that hired Steve McGuire and he's still here. <laughs> my philosophy from the beginning was the breed comes first, not an individual schemes to get rich quick. Give breeders all the facts, let them decide what they want their own cowherd to be. I see how far American Simmental Association has come with genomics and I'm proud to have contributed a very small part to the beginning. Thank you for inviting me to the 50th annual worship. Wait. Thank you, Don. Got actually something else. So, so these are the gifts we're giving a book to all the speakers. But Don gets something special because, well, let's face it, Don is special.
So, anyway, Don has been eyeing, I've had a, a bell in my office for quite a while. Leoma actually tracked it down from the old building. And when he comes over and visits, I've noticed him eyeing this bell up. So anyway, I, I decided that I think this bell is better, better served to be in Don's office. speaker is part of what uh, I guess I've always thought of as a dynamic duo. When it comes to genetic evaluation, uh, our next speaker, Dr. John Pollock, and his cohort, uh, Dr. Dick Kwas, were as good as it gets. And we happen to have the privilege of having them be part of our journey for over two decades. Uh, following that, John went on to uh, be a director at the Meat Animal Research Center. Um, just stepped down very recently. Uh, and I will always wanted to say this, I never told you this, John, but so uh, a number of years ago, his uh, <coughs> counterpart, Dick Quas, was being honored at the BIF convention, I can't even remember where it was, it was maybe in, uh, was it, was it, it was in Missouri. And John gave one of the most moving, heartfelt talks that I've ever heard. And one of the things I'll always remember, at the end of the talk, he said, it's been a hell of a ride, Dick. And I think we can say, it's been a hell of a ride, John. John Pollock has done, and Dick Quas, done immeasurable things for the American Semitol Association. So it is an honor to have him come back and talk to this group. So with that, we'll pass it on. To Oh, is this a spewed all over the floor with that? <laughs> Seriously? I can click it for you. Here, just put the batteries in it. Bill, you want to come and tell Dirty Limerick? John, I Okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come back and celebrate the 50th anniversary with you. It's been something like 13, 14 years uh, since I've been involved in the Semental Association. And looking out, it's nice to see <coughs> faces that I recognize from days gone by. I was asked to talk a little bit about the genetic evaluation program, and in particular, the work and the partnership between ASA and Cornell. And so I started off with this title, but I got to thinking that in talking about history, there's got to be a purpose. And the purpose I'd like to uh, try and create in this particular presentation is to talk about the culture of ASA. I remember a quote, but I couldn't find it, so this is somewhat of my version of it. The culture of an organization can be defined by its history. And so if we look back on at least the genetic evaluation portion of the history of ASA, what I came up with 
And this was easy to come up with because it was the impression I had the first time we talked about doing things together. And that is, it's a continuing story of innovation. Before I get into this story, however, I want to give you the title of a few other presentations I've made just recently. This one here, <clears throat> done in June, was the celebration of the 50th anniversary of VIF. This guy, and this is his portrait that's hanging in Sirline's, Sadler Sirline, was one of the original people who met to discuss the formation of BIF. And Dave has a picture, and you're the only survivor of that group, right? You must have been a kid. <laughs> the other talk I gave, which was done just a few years ago, was on the 50th anniversary of the Meat Animal Research Center. And the reason I bring these up is Think about 50 years ago. The 1960s was an absolutely phenomenal decade for the beef industry. In fact, it was one that from that time forward had changed the industry dramatically. The importation of what were then called exotic breeds, the increased focus that was being given to performance information driving selection of beef cattle, and a research center that for most of its research lifetime has been doing germplasm evaluation of these breeds of cattle, all beginning 50 years ago. But let's get back to the story. I didn't know you penned that. I often wondered where it came from, but wasn't clever enough to ask. But that, this is a great present, a uh, great motto to have. And the timing of it was perfect. The timing of it was perfect because it emphasized the growing <coughs> desire of producers to understand what their data was telling them. If you talk about the history of the association between ASA and Cornell, to me it was like a nebulous cloud starting to come together to form a star. There was a whole bunch of people who were doing things that sort of set the track for us to actually get together. And I want to step through some of those. Charles Henderson and no conversation about genetic evaluation can take place for livestock or dairy without the mention of Charles Henderson. He was a graduate student at Iowa State, Dr. J. Lush, and he went to Cornell in 1948. Dr. Henderson's research career was centered around the development of what was referred to as best linear unbiased prediction. Unfortunately, the acronym for that was BLUP. <laughs> we lived with that. And Dr. Henderson, the methodology that he developed became the backbone of genetic evaluations around the world. He had a tremendous, tremendous impact. When he went to Cornell, <coughs> he established a group of scientists that focused on that methodology but also the application of that methodology to large field data sets. That was his passion. At Cornell University at that time, they had the Northeast Dairy Records Processing Lab. And that lab got information from all over the Northeast. This, the lab was right across from the uh, animal breeding group offices. And so they were applying this methodology and studying this methodology in dairy. Paul Miller. Paul Miller was also at Cornell in the late 1960s, and he learned the bluff methods there, but he later went to work for ABS. 
He taught the introductory genetics class at Cornell while I was there, and I was a student in his class. But that's not what I'm talking about Paul about. For some, I don't know how you did it, but you got Paul to create that first genetic evaluation program that was used by ASA starting with the publication in 1971. When Paul left ABS, Dr. Quas was his replacement. Now you see this cloud <coughs> starting to shrink down. In 1978, while I was on the staff at the University of California at Davis, I went to Cornell on a three-month sabbatic. And my sole purpose for going was to learn more about best linear unbiased prediction from Dr. Henderson. Unfortunately, he had retired in 1976, and although he <laughs> still had Cornell working daily, I don't know if it was because of me or for some other reason, he decided to paint his house. <laughs> and he told me that he wasn't going to have a lot of time with me unless I painted with him. <laughs> I opted out. <laughs> but, to my disappointment then, I was assigned to the new guy, Dr. Quas, to do some projects in beef cattle evaluation. And that was the start of the relationship that we had for the many decades as we worked together. We studied the application of the methodology in particular to beef cattle evaluation, and our interest was in a model that we referred to as the animal model. And we took all of the simulation work that we did and all of the things that we learned in the first couple of years of collaboration. And we wrote a paper. And that paper was published in 1980, which happened to be the same year that I moved to Cornell from Davis. Now keep this in mind, because we wrote this paper, we published it, and we would talk over coffee numerous times about how great it would be to have a beef data set to play with at Cornell University. Unbeknownst to us, a German scientist was working in Agbu at the University of New England in 1980 on a postdoc. And while he was there, he was charged with developing a genetic evaluation system for the Australian Semitol Association. And he used the exact methodology that we published in that paper. And we didn't know anything about that. <clears throat> they released that first evaluation in 1982. And that was the end of Hans's postdoc there. And I think he was on his way back to Germany, but he decided to stop at ASA. ASA, at that time, I was told, was considering to updating the evaluation program that Paul wrote. Hans came and visited and discussed the Semitol evaluation he had done from Australia. Now, he was going west to east now, and so on his way home, oops, He stopped at Cornell. And that was really the first time we became aware anybody had actually taken our method and applied it to a large data set. Not huge, by the standards here in the U.S., but fairly large. And while he was there, he told us, you ought to call Dr. Peterson and tell him you'd be interested in working with them to change the program that Paul had built. So here's two guys who are not really that well known in the industry itself, sitting across from each other at my desk, and both of you know Dick, he smoked a corn cob pipe in those days, and when he was nervous he could fill a room of <laughs> smoke like nobody. 
And I dialed up Earl and told him who we were, told him that we would like to talk to them about being involved in their genetic evaluation and research in their data set. I give Earl a lot of credit. He was very polite. He told me that you were interested in applying BLUP and I should contact Paul Miller to find out what that was and why they wanted it. <laughs> I got off the phone with Dick and I said, we've got a long way to go, my friend. <laughs> But the exciting thing is, Paul was very open to us because we knew him well, and he knew what we were doing there at Cornell. So we met with several board members and a technical committee that was made up of Roy Wallace, Paul Miller, Ansel Armstrong, and Larry Benishek, who was at the University of Georgia, and a few staff people, Steve was there, and a few board members presented our ideas, and I don't know, if you are in a PhD program, when you're done with your exam in front of your committee, they send you out in the hall, they evaluate what you did, and then they call you back in. Well, at the end of this meeting, where we were making our presentation, we went out in the hall, <laughs> waited, <laughs> And they called us back in, and this was the charge that we heard when we came back into the room, when they told us that they wanted to pursue this idea a little further. I think it was John Teagarden uh, who told us about this, but he said, we want you to put Semental in a leader position in this space. And we want you to keep us there. Going home, I told Dick, this organization is all about two things, innovate and involve. And that was very exciting to us. What did we mean by innovate for this first particular project? Well, at the time, ASA was using the model Paul developed. And by the way, it was a block model. It was just a very simple one. It did only sires with progeny, which was standard for those days. And what we were proposing is the simultaneous evaluation of every animal in the database. Bulls were assumed unrelated to each other because that's all we knew how to do at that time. We knew how to incorporate the information from relationships but because of some matrix requirements, we couldn't actually incorporate it. But in 1976, Henderson developed a trick that we knew about and Paul didn't, obviously. And so we could include all relationships in the evaluation of all animals. It assumed random mating of bulls to cows, If you simultaneously fit cows with the genetic evaluation of bulls, the merit of the mates are accounted for. And so we would remove the bias in non-random mating of bulls. There were no maternal effects in that model. And obviously, for some of the traits, there is the need to include a maternal effect. And that was what we were going to propose where needed. And it was a single trait analysis. And to be honest with you, when we started off, we felt like a single trait analysis, applying the animal model because it was so large, was probably what we could accomplish. It was very interesting to me, the industry discussion that took place after we started this particular project. We made presentations about what we had hoped to do, and there was a lot of discussion about whether or not that was the right thing for the industry to do at that time. I was a bit stunned at that, 
But when you think back, what we were doing was proposing a real change in the way animals were evaluated. And that meant that if we were successful with Simmental, other organizations would have to follow suit. And this was a big change. After hearing some of this discussion, Drs. Frank Baker and Richard Wilhelm organized a meeting at the Prediction at the Winrock Foundation to discuss genetic evaluations. I look at this, for those of you who've attended them, as really being the first genetic prediction workshop. The reason I say that is there were beef geneticists, breed association and AI representatives. And we made a presentation about what we were going to do in full detail and why we thought it was the route to go. I say we, Dick went to Australia for sabbatic and left me out there to dry. But what I didn't appreciate and came to appreciate at that meeting is immediately the focus was on the fact that if this particular procedure was applied, you could now compare yearling bulls between herds. Prior to that, there were within herd indexes or in herd ratios, but you couldn't compare animals because you didn't have their genetic base within each herd identified. And this was something that was really discussed. I give them credit because the question they asked is if you can't do this well, you're not going to hurt an individual bull. You're going to hurt an individual breeder. Hop Dickinson, who was with the Hereford Association at that time, in his summary of the meeting that we had, said there was no way he could convince his membership to apply this kind of program. Well, that was fine, except all this discussion, I think for the first time, Earl Peterson was sitting there, starting to hear some negative vibes about what we were going to do. And that night, he called me and Paul Miller into his hotel room in Little Rock and told me <laughs> what things were going to be like. And I don't know, those of you who know Earl, he could be very direct. <laughs> and the question he asked was pretty much the same one that we had gotten before. Are you sure you can do this well enough that you will be right on how you rank animals across terms, particularly those of young yearling bulls? Well, I was 37 years old at that time. And I wasn't about to speak up, and Paul Miller was sitting there. And fortunately, Paul stepped up and said, yeah, these guys will do it right. Then over beer later, I said, you better do it. <laughs> Our goal was to implement this animal model. And when we first got the data from ASA, we started playing around with it to look at the animals that were in there, the records that they had. And the first thing we noticed was this huge discrepancy in the number of weaning weights that were reported and the number of yearling weights that were reported. And we looked at that a little bit, and we had done some research earlier on selection bias. And in this case, the selection bias was, how are you affecting the yearling weight evaluations of bulls if you do selection at weaning? And we were concerned about that, so we examined it a little bit, and we decided that we could not do a single trait analysis of yearling weight. It had to be a multiple trait. And so we then switched our philosophy from doing a single trait, multiple, a single trait analysis to a multiple trait evaluation for all three traits. Unfortunately, you couldn't do the animal model, we couldn't at that time, doing multiple traits simply because of computing power. 
And so we had to go back to a model that was called the sire maternal grandsire model. This was a real bust of the ego balloon, I'll tell you, <laughs> to come back and tell them that we, we had to switch to this, but it was a choice whether doing multiple traits to handle selection bias or single traits to do all the evaluations simultaneously. We can still do the evaluation of the other animals. It just became a two-step process, not one. We presented our results on numerous occasions to the board as we went along. And when we went there to present the final results, they told us they wanted Roy Wallace to look at his bulls. You know, those of you who know Roy, remember he'd hold that cigar in his mouth and chew and chew and chew on it? Well, he had a computer printout of his bull sitting at a table like this, chewing on that cigar, while Dick and I, once again, were out in the hall, <laughs> <laughs> waiting for the, the results. Roy was, Roy was very complimentary of the way his bulls were evaluated, uh, very supportive of the program. We passed that test and it was published in 1984. We did the SEMBRA three years later with the weight traits in 1987. So things started. What were the reactions? Now remember, this was a huge change. And so bulls re-ranked. Animals were evaluated now on an EPD scale rather than the within herd that they were before. And my favorite two questions that we got were I don't know how many times we answered this question and the idea here being that those daughters were now being compared to their contemporaries from maternal milk to maternal weaning weight and they may wean 600 pound calves in a 620 pound contemporary group. The other question, which was totally correct, was if I had a bull and progeny from him, and I took their birth weights, and I reported those birth weights, if he was below average for birth weight, the program, because of the negative of the correlations between birth weaning and yearling, made him below average typically for the other two traits. This was at a time when people were looking for those outliers, birth weight down, weaning and yearling up. This was a part of the system, and I think some producers told me they weren't going to report weaning weight or birth weights until they had the weaning weights. Again, something that uh, was a result of the switch. But it did emphasize one thing to us. We had done a poor job not a poor job. We just didn't go the full nine yards of getting the education out to people about what to expect on these evaluations. And I think the association and us, when we were partners, learned that lesson and got much better as time went on. So what was happening in other breeds at that time? Well, in the early 60s, Iowa State and the University of Georgia were engaged in genetic evaluations. Colorado State became involved during that uh, time period, a little after 1980. I think it was when Bruce was there for his PhD and after. And there was a rapid adoption of this animal model. I know they were smarter than us, they could get it done. Georgia did limousine and Brangus, CSU did Gelby and CSU did Red Angus after that. All of a sudden, the industry converted from the sire model and within herd type evaluations to one now where animals across an entire breed were on the same scale of measure. That was a huge change in the industry at that time. Colorado and Georgia stepped up because now the demand was increasing to take on multiple breeds. Our agreement with Semental was that we were a research arm of Semental, and so we wouldn't take on other breeds and use that system 
and that evaluation. I would never regretted that because this was a yeoman's job to do that for the multiple breeds in the industry. You often hear that back in that time when these breeds started to align with the various universities, that there was huge competition between the universities associated with those breeds. And that was true. We were all racing to implement new models, to do more genetic evaluations, and developing methods. And I say it was a healthy competition because there were a whole bunch of scientists looking at the same problem, coming up with different approaches, and doing it at what, for geneticists, is light speed. But we always published. We always discussed the methods. And we continued to interact with each other on what was being developed. And in a sense, we kept this entire evaluation process in the public domain, which was huge. The other thing that we never really give credit for is that we now had data sets. These major breed organization data sets resided in four universities and graduate students were pouring through that data doing a large number of research projects. I think we learned more about the national data sets in that short period of time than ever before. And there are people in this room right now who benefited from being associated with those programs. Is Lauren Hyde here? Yep, way in the back. Uh, is Wade Schaefer here <laughs> was in those programs. A lot of people, there's probably others in here, who studied and learned about the industry and their data sets came out to be leaders in the industry with a very strong foundation in understanding your genetic systems. After the weight trait, we went to calving ease. And that was first published in 1987. And under the theme of innovation, ASA wanted to combine the birth weight and calving ease evaluation. We wanted to do it for direct and maternal calving ease and using birth weight, as I mentioned, as an indicator for calving ease. This sparked a debate. I was on one side, and all of you in this room were on the other. <laughs> you weren't alone. We asked the question once, actually multiple times, as to if you're using the information on birth weight to predict calving ease, why show birth weight anymore? It's an indicator trait. We didn't have quite that situation well articulated as it was in 2000 at a BIF meeting about the differential between uh, indicator traits and economically relevant ones. But we posed the question. You look at a sire summary recently? <laughs> I lost that debate. And if you're gonna change, I'm 71, let's not <laughs> delay too much longer, okay? But there was a question that was asked every time of us that we could never guarantee, and so we always lost debates like this. Can you guarantee me that the people I sell these bulls to will understand calving ease well enough that I don't need a birth weight evaluation to show? Well, we couldn't. That was the calving ease evaluation. <clears throat> carcass traits, we did our first carcass trait evaluation and published it in 1993. It was a multiple trait analysis, just like the weight traits. But then in 2003, as the ultrasound data 
started to accumulate, we added that to the analysis as a correlated indicator trait. As I mentioned in 2000, we now had this concept being bandied about in the industry, thanks to Bruce Golden and Darren Garrick, of these are economically relevant traits and these are indicated traits. If you're using these to indicate those, this is where you need to put your focus. So, sort of against what was being done at the industry at the time, ASA did not publish results for the ultrasound traits themselves. They were in the analysis and they contributed. And this was at a time when analysis were being done separate for ultrasound and for carcass in some of the other organizations. That led to some confusion and over time they did merge those into other evaluations. But I always appreciated ASA's approach on this. I thought it was a cookie to me, having lost the birth weight. I'm going to mention tenderness, although it's an evaluation. Anybody here ever seen those tenderness evaluations? Dave Nichols raised them. <laughs> That's it? I can't tell you how hard we worked on this. I wondered. Well, in the late 1990s, due to some audits that went on, there was some real concern about the consumer's view of beef based on the tenderness of there. And there were numbers being bandied around that one in every five eating experience was for a tough piece of meat and that consumers were less likely to start paying more premiums for, for uh, beef under that scenario. And Jerry Lipsy and Mike Dykeman came up with this absolutely brilliant idea of going in and studying tenderness, not on commercial animals, but studying it on progeny of prominent bulls within the breed. And this idea was brought up for funding at NCBA. NCBA actually funded, but under one proviso, all breeds could be involved. Mike, did you ever regret that? <laughs> this was the birth of the Carcass Merit Project and one of the most interesting projects that I was ever involved in because all the breeds were engaged, we met continuously, people were very interested in the results, and we collected thousands of stakes on 14 breeds of cattle in total. At that time, Texas A&M also was working with NB NCBA to do DNA genomics work. And I don't know, Dave, was you and some of the others who encouraged the merger of this Carcass Merit Project with the Texas A&M program? Yeah, it was Taylor and Nichols. Taylor and Nichols. What a combination. <laughs> <laughs> the legacy of this project was enormous. We didn't realize it at that time, but Stuart Bach, then at Igenity, you used this data set. Uh, at that time, Pfizer had a DNA program. They used it. This contributed a lot to our knowledge of genomics. In 2002, we did publish the first genetic evaluation for tenderness based on these data. And when the genotypes for two of the markers there are actually three markers for two genes, calpane and calcostatin, were being done on these animals. In 2006, where did it go? we actually did a genomically enhanced EPD. A small number of data, a small number of SNPs, but nonetheless, a genomically enhanced EPD for tenderness. I think those were the only new traits that we added to the system 
uh, while we were in the partnership. Others were brought online, but those weren't uh, from what we were doing. But also during this time was an evolution of the weight trade program. There were two unresolved issues. My herd ego <laughs> and the handling of percentage cattle. When we were looking at this, because of the upgrading system, there are 50%, 75%, Don mentioned it, these grade up cattle that were in the database. And we never felt like we really handled those animals well in the genetic evaluation. We put them in separate contemporary groups, and that was about all that we would do. We released the first animal model evaluation in 1993. It was multiple trade. We were behind the times, but at that time we also used differing variances for the percentage of cattle and sex of calf. Because what we realized is the heritabilities that we saw from records coming from different animals differ depending on their percentage. I'm going to come back to this <coughs> particular evaluation because the interesting thing here is we were now studying those other breeds in the database. This was my favorite quote from a 712 breeder at a presentation I made. <laughs> when we came out with this evaluation, sitting in the front row, said to me, so you've been wrong all these years. <laughs> Dick Quasp was on a plane coming in late, and he had just walked into the room, and he missed the question. And he said, I knew immediately something was wrong because you were just standing up there, <laughs> staring at this guy. <laughs> Think about that. When we change a system, and you're going through it, change is inevitable. You have to change. Methods get better. Information gets better. New information comes online. Doesn't mean you were wrong before. It meant you were as right as you could be, just not as right as you will ever be. Keep that in mind. Maybe you won't try uh, poor Wade Ball. As you know, so you know, these changes. The second major change, since now we were into it, we felt we could change this program anytime was to go to multi-breed genetic evaluations. And because of the knowledge we gained doing that first change for the heterogeneous variances, we had some good ideas about what could be done. And Gordon was sort of the champion of this. And he tells the story that in one of the board meetings, he asked me, could we do this? And my typical response is to look at Dick and say, can we do this? And he said, yes. And ASA did something to me that to me was absolutely incredible, which I think emphasizes the importance they place on providing the best genetic information they can to you. They hired a graduate student at Cornell named Bert Cly to build this system. And they told him they wanted it built in two years, and so they'll pay him for two years. But if he got it done in one, they'd give him the second year salary. Bert was a good student, but I never saw him work that hard. <laughs> <laughs> and he got that thing done in really short order. The motivation was simply to handle better the different breed and breed genes represented in the Semental database. But I think everybody was thinking that if you built it, they will come. <laughs> and that was sort of our motto while we were building this. And I'm glad to see that, what is it now? 20 years later, we're coming. This was, I think, one of the most incredible experiences we had on the scientific side of creating a system that has, one, lasted as long as it has because you've been using it for quite some time, but two, set the stage for the future. We implemented it in the late 90s, it was 97 or 99, and in fact, three breeds did join. 
think it was Kianina, May Not You, and Gelpi. Right? Canadians. And the it was what? Canadian sound call. Gelpi didn't come along until later. Okay. One of the issues we had, and we always talked to producers at meetings about, they, uh, I was really pleased that they felt comfortable enough to tell us issues they thought they were seeing in the database. And one that came to us that <clears throat> really mattered, and we hadn't thought about it, was that for bulls of other breeds, we were giving the, getting their genetic evaluation solely from the data in your database. And so over here, you would have an Angus bull with a 90 plus percent accuracy, and in our data set, he'd have a low accuracy. And as expected, the evaluations could be quite different. Dick created a methodology for bringing in EPDs from the other breeds genetic evaluations into the ASA evaluation. And organizations like Red Angus, and Bob back there, gave us that information in a spirit of sharing. Anybody from the Angus Association? <laughs> For other associations, we had to do what is illegally referred to as screen screening. <laughs> Their cyber evaluation program to get the information. But this changed the game because now we could bring all that information from the other breeds into your evaluation and get those bulls right and really help in the evaluation of any animal that was a relative of those. All good things come to an end, and in the late 1990s, some forces started to appear on the horizon that gave us concern about sustaining a relationship like we had. Cornell University had a dean named David Call, whose family were huge in the dairy business in Northeast uh, up in New York, actually. And I had mentioned to you early that the, the uh, Dairy Records Processing Lab was located on campus. Well, Dave started studying service that was being provided by Cornell to industries, and he moved that Dairy Records pro uh, Processing Lab off campus. And I thought if he would do that, What's he going to do if he ever discovered that when we said in the grants that we got from you that we were monitoring the population, that we were actually doing the service of running a genetic evaluation? The other thing that was happening, inflation at a university far outpaces inflation in the general world, is only beat by Medicare or Medicare. <laughs> And in addition, Dick and I were aging. Agree? <laughs> okay. And Cornell was focusing at that time, as many universities were, on molecular genetics and the skill sets required to do that. And those people being trained in that area at that time did not have the same skills that the quantitative geneticists had. And it was obvious to us that we were not going to be replaced at Cornell by faculty trained as we were. So there was a vulnerability that was brewing for our continued running of the genetic evaluation program. And we started having conversations about moving the system here to the to the to Semitol Association. The four universities, although we had great in the 80s and 90s competition, now things were starting to get to the point where any time they did it, we did it. And so we were developing the same systems in four different locations. And the drain of resources on the industry to accomplish that, we felt were getting out of hand. We were also faced with this DNA challenge. We knew coming down the pipeline someday, something was going to have to be done about that which meant system changes, you're going through it, 
And that would have had to have been done location after location. A lot of stress, we felt, was being put on the system. So to address these concerns, we decided as the four university to create a consortium called the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium. And actually, the industry helped us lobby Congress for a special grant that lasted for seven years. Several million dollars over that time period came into the industry to help support and sustain the genetic evaluation system. At that time, we felt that the industry should create or would create what we called entities to do, to do genetic evaluations. And that NBCEC would be the R&D arm of those entities. So we could work on one project and distribute it rather than each of us do the same project in four locations. Unfortunately, pork went out of the congressional language and after seven years the fund had ending, but in fact these entities did start to exist. In, in 2006, ASA took the evaluation system in-house and in reality set the foundation to become one of these entities. That was stressful. It was stressful on the research side, it was stressful on the industry side to say we got to turn this over. But you look back, nobody's at Cornell. Keith Bertrand became a chairman and not a scientist anymore at Georgia. Bruce left to go to a company that developed that corneal yeah, identification system. The, the universities were in flux, so it was the right decision. ASA, in my opinion, has continued to develop a genetic program to support members. All of these activities, and you're going to hear more about them, I think represent continuing progress. I congratulate you on that. And I thank you for the years that you allowed us to be part of your innovative journey. Thank you.